so they can't trust me. Yeah, thank you all to them from my side, also to Japan. Very, very interesting experience for me also. <laughs> Being part of this, I'm very happy that I can uh, be the one who's going to this course in this test. Um, so what I want to do now is, as um, um, you have already mentioned, um, I want to give you findings uh, of a research project we did um, the last two years, basically. Um, the research project is on peace processes in what we call complex multi-actor conflicts, which means basically contexts where there is more than one non-state armed group present on the ground. Um, um, the project is located at um, the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, it's funded by the research fund of the Austrian Central Bank, Bank, so it's part of the research money we are working with. Um, what we do, what we did and what we do in this project is we compare um, the interrelations between the various peace processes running in a given context and try to bring this comparison also not only to one country but to use experiences from several countries. The two main case studies have been Colombia and the Philippines. Um, as told my colleague Stephen Kittel has been here um, from I guess April or May to September. Um, we have both been also to Colombia and collected uh, I guess um, um, in total about 182 to 200 interviews and a lot of material in that. And what I want to try now is to give you somehow back what we found out from all these interviews um, to somehow deliver also something for what can be perhaps of use for this. Um, so what, one, what I want to do um, in the next 40 minutes is um, to um, present the tool we came up with in our in conceptualizing the way uh, this piece um, process went. We used there the concept of political settlement, which is in recent years, which has gained a lot of importance in analysis. We found this concept is a very interesting way of dealing with um, particular multiple actor conflicts um, and I want to raise particularly and discuss two research questions today which is one what we can learn of four peace processes when applying this concept to settlements and the second one then does this concept offer any really added value is it necessary can it help something what we perhaps might not see else um, as case studies, as mentioned, Colombia and the Philippines, of course, since it's the main, was the main part of the project. But I'm also going to use um, my experience that I have in the case of Sudan and South Sudan, where I did some work on and in um, those countries. So these three case studies basically are the background I want to base my comparison on. Brief outline. Um, in the first about 15 minutes, I want to, to present the discuss the concept of political settlements, which is of some relevance, I guess, for the Philippines, and there's also some base here I want to say. Um, then I want to focus on the empirical findings of our research, which will, where we'll try to identify five key mechanisms of, of these two processes and the interrelation with the political settlement, and then conclude with discussing these two research questions I've raised. So let's start with the concept of the political settlement. Where does it come from? It was developed um, in the form we are discussing today um, around the years 2008 to 2010. So it's a very recent concept in a way. And it came as so many of these tools come from mainly from the United Kingdom, where the one school technologies was very active in developing this, especially the press space which is centered there. Jonathan G. John, James Putzlar, two names which are behind this concept and which also these two names also guaranteed that K was came in the last year's quite popular also in policy realm. So the development assistance committee of the USD is working with that concept and this is mainly due to the, this development that the LSD of course. With my relevance for the Philippines is that the concept was also used developed by the Asian Foundation, which is but present here. The country was also used in their activities in the Philippines. 
especially Tom Parks, and going cold, or they both um, developed with paper in, in 2010 on the concept of doing settlements. And there is still, as I was told, some relevance in their work. With some problems, of course, and some, some shortcomings, but still used. So it's somehow linked also to here. Um, as a background, the draws on concepts which are picture quite older. Perhaps some of you might have heard or come across the name Joe Mittal, who is uh, very much uh, one of the big names behind this thinking of states or societies as an interlinkage where states are not that any longer that um, and, uh, oh yeah. We should also be seeing the PowerPoint slides. And he is in the PowerPoint or show us yeah, some slides. Yeah, we can see it now, so... Uh, right, so... <laughs> what were you seeing? Sorry for disturbing. Do you see it now? Uh, no, not now. Okay. Oh, Yeah, we got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The, the audio is also, um, is also loud enough. Is the audio also loud? Loud enough? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, then I'll continue. Just to make that was just the background, so if you might come across him, I won't go into further detail about what he called stating society approach. The only important thing is there that we are dealing with concepts which are not treating the state as something special or something completely else than other societal organizations. This is the whole point I want to make here. It's also the case for the settlements or with the approach for the Alex developing the marketplaces. Here the state is just one of several actors which are which, which is present in, in society and societal organizations. This is the main background here, the main starting point of thinking and conceptual. Particular for political settlements is uh, the connection of the concept to the new institutional economy. Um, that is more than, than others. Uh, you might have that word also. Um, well, this concept, what they call limited access orders, and on the other hand, open access orders. Also, just give you a brief background on this um, concept, and this is, of course, some, uh, some something like a black and white concept. So it's not, well, I'm not completely uncritical with this, but just give you the background of the thinking. Um, open access orders is that you're able, more or less, to by your effort, by your talent, also by luck, you are able to come to the elite ranks in politics, in economy, also in social uh, relations. So you're able to this kind of this society is so open that you're able to have success in there. With limited access orders, this is not the case as such. You can have as much as talent as you like, you can have as much as uh, also talent as you like, or effort, good effort. In. You will be limited through networks that are in place. The elite ranks, they can close. And in this setting where you have quite very close elite ranks, which is not possible for others to enter, then the settlements come in place as an elite pact, which are mostly uh, very informal structures. So we are talking about formal structures, but about informal structures taking place in just such limited access orders. This is what Jonathan D. John and also envisioned when they introduced the conference. So, and this is also what we've heard already in the introduction, there is a huge difference between peace settlements and political settlements. Although these two terms are quite often used interchangeably, um, we, are, we are talking here about the different things. Political settlements are strictly formal ways of doing things which are permanent under negotiation, renegotiation, renegotiation, whereas these settlements, of course, they have a treaty in place with a signed treaty and they have a kind of very fixed order you have to follow. So there are this difference, while at the same time, of course, these two things, these settlements, these settlements, are closely integrated. So this is uh, what it states here. Um, so if there are peace negotiations taking place in such a political settlement, it's 
mostly because of two issues. On the one hand, often it is necessary to reconfiguration since settlement proofs to be no longer successful in one way or the other, or there is even a complete breakdown of settlement if there is a need of a complete rebuilding. So to come to definitions, um, there are multiple definitions available. There is no common understanding of what is such a settlement yet. But we relied mostly on the initial definition written by Jonathan B. John and Hutzel. They said it's a bargaining outcome among contending elites. So you see that this is also always a process in a way. And these bargaining outcomes manifest themselves in the structure of property rights and entitlements that are shaped by the legal organization. A little bit deeper, um, we refer to the paper by the Asian Foundation, saying there are three key elements in which such political settlements are characterized as actors, interests, institutions, and these three elements are interlinked. And we want, what we added then to this in our research is that we found it quite important to say that such act actors, interests, institutions are not are necessarily an objective given but they are very much in their importance shaped by the, the perceptions of the various other actors around. Um, so actors or interests or institutions are only as powerful or as important as the perceptions of others made them or make them in a complete case. And therefore there is, and this is one of the problems we also have to deal with in many of these peace processes, there is not really an objective way of doing things. It's just not like you increase living standards and then uh, the conflict will stay away. This is the problem here. You have to deal with perceptions. These perceptions are somehow deeper than objective causes. I try to put this in, into a graph here to also um, demonstrate that this elite bargaining is not something which is taking place somehow rather completely disconnected with everything else in society, but that most of these actors, in one way or another, or the other, have to deal with their constituencies. This is somehow reflected. There is a game of expectations which are put into actors by their constituencies. There is the question of legitimacy always there. You cannot be somehow elite, an, an elite player without having some kind of legitimacy with you. It's not, of course, always a democratic one. In most cases, it might not be the case. But you have to, to deliver something in most cases. And this is also an important part of this game we are talking about. Very important is, and this tackles the thing, and what, we, what I raised before with the role of the state in this um, settlement. And we talked here, and we, we, we discussed that as a double role of the state. It's on one hand a very exceptional role, and on the other hand a very ordinary role the state has at the same time. Why exceptional? Because, of course, state actors have important resources, so they are. Uh, uh, disposal that other taxes don't have. They have uh, development money coming in, they have of course all the tax bases, they have natural resources, and, and they rip on these, which other actors might not have. And of course, and this might be especially in terms of negotiations, very important point, they have this international legitimacy. They are the states on the international level, and this international legitimacy has quite important role to play in all these. But on the other hand, and this is why we call it also ordinary, they have to play in most cases the very same game that other actors have to play in this game. So, so they are not exceptional as such. They are not to, to play by, uh, perhaps they are stronger in a way, but they are quite often not perceived as being something exceptional. So they, they, they are not just by definition something like a primus into Paris, like in the barbarian concept of, of statehood but they have to deal very much on the ground the same dirty things, dirty way of doing things like many artists have to. And this international legitimacy does not automatically transform in something like a regional or local legitimacy. This is a very important point we have to take into account. So what now, how to, to implement this in, in theory and also in, in policy development? I'll copy to you, Sheena, don't worry, I'm not going to all, through all these points now one by one. Um, this, is by, uh, this is from the paper of the Asia Foundation, and this concept more or less uh, has one thing to say, um, that there is a certain error going across this, that 
including settlements, are increased, getting increased stability when they're getting more and more inclusive. There is, of course, the, the option that you get kind of very exclusive community settlements which are stable in the short run. You see here, narrow elite concentrates power, we have authoritarian rule, which is quite working in a way quite well. Um, but this is, at least, that's the assumption here by the Asian Foundation. It is just a reasonable and uh, a limited uh, time, time perspective. If you want to have a settlement which is not stuck, just stable but sustainable and then resilient a longer framework, you need to be more exclusive, you need to have increased legitimacy of the settlement as it states here, you need to have as much elite groups uh, in there as you know, possible, you need and of course then strengthen the institutions. This means also state but also non-state institutions in that settlement. So this is the assumption um, behind this theory. Um, this hypothesis, as I've said already, the more inclusive a political settlement is, the more resilient it is. So there's the assumption behind that there is a certain distinction between stability and resilience in a way that so stability is something more short term and that the decisive moment is where there are stresses in here, um, external and internal shocks, certain outbreaks of oil violence at a certain point, and then the the real resilience of this is proved. So this is the important thing. And then there's the second assumption behind the hypothesis presented by Marx Cole and others, um, that the main problem mm -hmm. is of settlements their exclusiveness, so that not enough actors are present and those who are left out of the settlement and then become spoilers, uh, as we call it, and the mainstream these resources. So all what I'm presenting now uh, Empirical considerations deal with these assumptions, somehow try to, to feed into that hypothesis and try to discuss that, although not in terms of, of course, sort of reliable testing. This is not what we've done, what we have done, but uh, let's hope that we, I, we still came up with some reasonable things. So, just to get, get brief through the case studies, um, to give you context to the idea of the I guess with the context of the Philippines, the Philippines you are all perhaps more familiar than I am. We took here all these processes after the Marcus area, in particular, of course, the, the old now process of MNL and ILF. Also, of course, all the process of the National Democratic Front. And um, also the background, we have not we have not been through all the materials related to this, the CPLA and all these from there process. There are more materials that we have already. Not through, but uh, we have this in, in our in our focus. In Colombia, we uh, we dealt with all these processes from the 1980s onwards. Very important M9 and TPL, which are already finished. Then with the right wing um, paramilitaries of the AOC, um, self defense force, as they call themselves, so the right wing guerrilla, um, which is um, at the moment more or less finished, so to speak. And the ongoing negotiations still with FARC and BLM, which are BLM, but not, not, that, not ongoing at the moment, but still somehow that way, but two big left-wing governments. In Sudan, South Sudan, we dealt mainly with the so-called comprehensive peace agreement between North and South and its interrelations with the, the World War Peace Process, so the World Health Process, uh, which is also currently um, more or less fun. So so all these processes are not really, most of them not really finished, if so, there are certain um, problems still there. So we have a lot of material to deal with. So let's turn to these five, uh, I'm willing to, to these five empirical observations we want to make in the relations between peace processes and political settlements. The first empirical observation, this might be, well, some kind of very obvious very obvious thing that there is a strong interplay between the various processes. Um, mainly because any peace treaty that is signed in some way or is at the table acts as a benchmark for upcoming ones later. Um, we have this uh, at the moment in the Philippines, for example, very much in the current negotiations uh, where always the MOA, MOA ID, uh, is very present in all the things that are discussed, and also, of course, the 1996 agreement between the government and the MNLF is still 
treated as a, as a very important benchmark for what the MILF is now achieving in the institutions, what the government is able to give or not to give. Um, so this is, you come across this in all negotiation processes, negotiation processes basically. Um, and why it seems trivial, it is still in our experience, the role, there's a very underrated answer. It's always, uh, it seems to call it, to call it the players in the negotiations always by surprise if they are certainly realize, okay, there was something before and now we, there are certain amounts that we have to give the same thing away again. So it's, um, there's always a sudden, sudden um, awakening that further, uh, that older agreements still play a role when new agreements are discussed. You have this, for example, in Sudan very much with the comprehensive peace agreement the hard peace process, where the comprehensive peace agreement um, made a complete constitutional change to the constitution of Sudan. And this is, of course, a benchmark all that the full groups are now uh, achieving and looking at. They try to achieve that. Um, but the government doesn't want to give this away. You have the same as I've told with MLF and the MLF process. In now, now, basically, you have it very much with. Colombian case where the successes that in 19 had in the uh, negotiations, where there was also a constitutional assembly then in Colombia and uh, some very strong guarantees for the M90 to enter the regular political process as a political party. And this is something that far very much in the current negotiations looks at. So we have these interrelations in the day to play this one important period of observation. Second observation, this might contradict the first one already quite strongly, is that there is a strong connection of peace processes with a respective state administration and that there is um, a remarkably low continuity between different administrations. This is particularly observable in Colombia where I've listed just the last four administrations here, Sampo, Pestrana, Uribe, Santos, the four, last four presidents in Colombia. Um, we have uh, two, four years of terms there, which is now changing institutionally, so we are talking about uh, processes of eight years, more or less. Um, and there, every president seems to do something completely different compared to his predecessor. But some pair was very reluctant to negotiate anything. Pastrana gave, uh, perhaps some of you remember, this huge neutralized demilitarized zone to the park, which was as large as Germany, basically. So within the territory, it was just something incredible given the experience before. Uribe, on the other hand, cut this down completely, more or less, and now Santos started to, re to negotiate the fight again from point zero points. So you notice from every, from one um, administration to the other, you have huge changes in approach, huge changes also in, in their um, main focuses. Uribe, for example, very much focused on the agreement with the you see with the rapid impairment of the areas, which is also caused by his particular political life in the region where they were really strong. So we have quite a close personal connection to the citizens for the areas farming forces. This is to a certain extent also visible here in the Philippines, why you have the special case that the GMA administration was quite a long in place for one of the years. Uh, but this was a certain sort of exception there. But you have already now the problems in the negotiations uh, around the framework agreement um, now with MLF that the question of transition to a potential next administration 2016 is a quite huge point. And from our experience, it's quite right to show that this is a huge point. This is this is a make or break point for us to bring this into some continuity there. Um, in Sudan, it's a bit different since you have more or less the same president since 1989, so you have more continuity, but still there, there are, um, there's not this huge continuity in negotiations, this is more or less there, I've decided on the benefit of the government in Sudan, in Um Why is this the case? Uh, we asked ourselves when we brought there the two of the settlements in there. Uh, we came to the conclusion that this might be mainly caused by the interest of the particular state administration to strengthen their role in, our, in their national and also some regional settlements. 
Um, very important is the different influence of the defense sector, which is especially from a, a huge point um, in how negotiations are shaped and with whom, for what reason, and with what compromises are negotiated. So this is also bringing the army on board, getting yourself a strong foothold with the army was for the current president Santos one of the real big points in the negotiations with the FRC. Um, another important point is also the economic influence. Also the case uh, in Colombia, where you have a strong shift in economic elites in the negotiations from Uribe, which was, it, it was backed very much with the landlord elite, um, uh, farmer elite, um, while President Santos now, with his change approach, is more um, supported or strongly supported by the industrial elites of the big cities, uh, especially in Bogotá. So you have some completely different elements in there. And of course, it's on the other hand, the interest of the administration to get a strong football in this, in this very important allies for their, for their policies. So this might be one of the main reasons why it is so difficult, particularly with presidential systems like Colombia and Philippines so far, to get continuity from one administration to another. Further um, observation is, and this is dealing particularly the about problem of having more than one non state done group um, in place in the context. Most often, all these negotiations are exclusive, very exclusive processes. You have very rarely multiple party negotiations in place at the same time. You have one exception in Colombia in the early 1990s, where there was a kind of guerrilla coordination between various the left and guerrillas, which had 19 PPL in there, but also FR, FR and parts also PLN. But the closure of the agreement was then just with M19 and then the greater with PPL, and FAR went out of this, but they were not happy with what was achieved. So the success of this was only for parts of this. You have the same thing with the Doha Peace process in Darfur, but this process is clinically there from the very beginning to the end. In fact, you have some uh, groups always joining, then move out and join again, so you have the problem that both are not entirely successful. So, all the successful cases we're speaking about more or less are, are exclusive negotiations processes, which is one. So when there are the highest success rates, uh, success now we are speaking in terms of to a negotiated treaty and was signed and then also tier two in the implementation. Um, this is if you're in the, 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 the process, the peace process deals with a very limited regional context where you could say that the settlement which is uh, also in place there is getting formalized while this negotiation route. So you bring something which is informal there, in a formal sphere, informal into the formal pool again. You could argue that um, the, the Negros case or in parts of the Pierres is something which is following the path. You have it also in Colombia where some parts of these paramilitary negotiations which brought some of the settlements here in the Medellin which into a formalized thing. For a better or the worse, we have to say. Um, so this might be one of the contexts. The next um, success rate is when a national political settlement is really open, it's really changed. This happens quite rarely. Um, it happened with the N19 um, guerrilla in Colombia when the Colombian government proved willing to open the political game to another political party to really pave the way for legalization, to bring them in into really the, the the big game, so to speak, without eliminating them, because they tried to do the same with the party, which is to eliminate, eliminate <coughs> physically their political party, so this is not the way changes. So we're speaking here not only to a treaty, but really to a change in the settlement. And for M19, there is there might be several benchmarks to achieve the success, but they had at one time even the mayor of Bogota, which is the, the city with 10 plus million people in their the capital. So if you have the mayor there, then you have uh, some kind of political way to call the nationals on a national level. And this shows in a way that the national that the political settlement on the national level here is really open. Also because to gain the constitutional assembly, which was part of the peace process of that 19 is, is demonstrated. And then you have uh, the third case, which is uh, in terms of what happened before uh, parts of the first one 
everything settlement breaks down completely and there is need, uh, which is undeniable for a complete renegotiation. Re and this was more or less the case with Sudan, South Sudan, the comprehensive peace agreement, now then with the uh, independence of South Sudan at the end of the transition period. There was just a quick settlement not longer in place, it was just a broke down. There was no grip any longer for Sudanese authorities into South Sudan, not at all anymore. So it was part of it. We needed to, to find, find some kind of solution if we want to have a sort of war for the next 10 years. This was the case here. So these were basically, these are the four the three scenarios where you notice quite high success rates, but as said, mostly exclusive processes. Fourth, fourth observation, and this is the other, uh, the other side of the coin, what we have mentioned before. This exclusiveness has the problem that it almost immediately turns, in most cases, into criminality and uh, into The point I want to raise here is not that this happened and, and, and we just noticed it. The point here is that most often this is uh, perceived by international actors, but also by state actors and other actors in the place, often also by non-governmental organizations, as being then part of the flaw and a failure of the current process. But I'm not so sure that this is the case. I'm not so sure that it's always possible to avoid this. Since if you think uh, about peace treaties from the settlement perspective, there will be always uh, elites, local elites, which will be left out. And even if you try to bring everybody in, like we tried, um, for example, in the South Sudan case, having the whole political game within the South Sudanese People's Liberation Army, the Independence Guerrilla, um, and they gave them basically a whole country. Even then, there were possible splits after the independence now, with certain local elites grouping 100, 200 militarized people around them and just tried to get a better deal out for themselves in a new um, framework. Um, you have that in Angles, you have that in Cordilleras, of course, in the Philippines, you have that very much in Colombia. With all the Diamantine is a certain exception here, but with the AOC paramilitary treaty, you have that very much that you have the so called backrooms, as I've listed here in Spanish countries, and other gangs, more or less, which are coming out of former, at least their leaders come out of the former. Um, paramilitary areas and not trying to, to, to make the business uh, in their own way since they wouldn't have so much to win with that living. So you have I've listed just some of the examples. There will be splits and it's practically unavoidable that such an agreement in place that such, such splits can be avoided. You have to deal with that and it's, it's very difficult to deal with that and it's a very important part in, uh, in the implementation but you have to take that into account from the very beginning. It's not a flaw, and it's not suddenly something that happens. It's, of course, a bad thing, but you have to do it. Um, so, and this is the problem I have with the hypothesis uh, I raised in the beginning regarding the political settlements. Is inclusive enough here a viable option? You might not be able to bring something in place which is inclusive enough. There will be left outs, and every inclusion tends to create a new institution by like splits, breakups, and other things. Um, how to deal with that? Well, there's always the, the well, somehow it's, it's for governments often a viable option to um, rationalize this as a police problem and send police or even military to, to solve this, but this might not be the right place. But it's always, on the other hand, that even the best development programs uh, won't be able to solve that completely. So you have to find your right balance. It might be a very contextualized way to deal with that in every context you might have the best possible solution. But so, coming to the fifth and final observation I, I want to raise is, again, regarding state actors. Um, as I've said in the beginning, the concept of the settlements, um, the role of the state is somehow a double role, as a one point, on the one hand, as one actor, one player in the negotiation, renegotiation of the settlement, on the other hand, as a kind of a referee or even guarantee. For example, in the Philippines, of course, the Malaysian government of the diplomatic matters, for them, the connection to the Philippine government is a special one. It can't be the same like with them. It's just not possible under the rules of the diplomatic game. So you have to deal 
and we all have to deal in negotiation processes with this type of problem. Um, and it is also by all actors to a certain point accepted. If a non state group decides to engage with this process, they have to accept this that the state is not completely on par with them. Of course, they have to treat, to treat them on par, but of course, they are also knowing that with certain exceptions to the Sudanese situation when they have this group in mind already, that if you are not really have a viable option of your own state or something like that, you have to see that the state is on a different level. Um, so this is the legitimacy, legitimacy issue I've raised at the beginning. There is not a particular legitimacy on a, on a local and a regional level. So there is this ground of legitimacy is often not the place because this is in the beginning often the very reason why the non-state armed groups exist in the first place. So this international legitimacy and local regional legitimacy are disconnected. Um, in all three cases, that is observable, and and these are the questions that I'll, I'll raise shortly. Then, <coughs> the conclusions I'm coming to uh, right now. Um, well, you have certain being the state, you have certain uh, avenues you can um, you can move forward when dealing with this problem of your global role. You can, of course, give something like constitutional changes, which happen in some cases, but it's happen very rarely. But if it happens. In most cases, proof you can be successful. You have, of course, then what is happening at the moment here in Vietnam quite, quite often public outreach campaigns of state actors trying to, to, to demonstrate that they're all control the players on the ground and bring them money in. And then you have, of course, the somehow traditional options like Joe Mikdal uh, listing them in the, his state and society approach, try to pull out some of the players. And MLF players, for example, um, You have, of course, on the other hand, the repression option, semi policing, dealing with that as a police problem, which is now being discussed with the kind of authority of the Swari and MLF as well. So, I've been option there. If it's the best way to deal, I'm not really sure actually what I'm saying. It's for state actors always a uh, case in point because they have this goal that might look so easy. Still, strategic problems will remain, and this is where I'm coming down to conclusions. Um, I see that this contradicting double goal of the state might be make a great point in many of the negotiations uh, and in the interplay with the grid is in place. Um, again, along with that, the second big problem is that every conclusion creates a lot of try to demonstrate a new execution also with actors which are not part of the settlement and you have to deal with both of, both of these problems. Um, key here, and this is where I'm, I'm shifting now, is for me the term legitimacy and the concept of legitimacy <coughs> in there. Um, you have to, to find ways how to bring not only the settlement into a legitimate um, um, state, but also all the actors which are in this uh, settlement somehow in place and are then, at least in parts, also uh, part of the formal treaty, they have to have some kind of legitimacy on the ground. Um, and then you just cannot rely on the concept of the international legitimacy the state has or, or just being a state actor it's, it doesn't uh, relieve you of your obligation to bring in something like around the legitimacy you might be also put on or, or, or based on the output you deliver on the ground. But uh, this is your hypothesis I want to raise. There might be no universal way how this can be solved. There might be just contextualized, very contextualized ways on how to deal with this legitimacy issue. The very promising thing I noticed in the last years that this is increasingly discussed at the international level. So also at the Development Assistance Committee, they are dealing with the peace processes there and also state building. They are very much now discussing this concept of legitimacy, how to deal with traditional legitimacy, forms of traditional legitimacy, how to bring in this more economic concept of output input legitimacy, how to link that with international legitimacy. Bringing this together, there might be not a formula which is universal um, or universally accepted or could be universal um, in terms of success, but 
At least, I guess, these are the right questions that you're raising. Coming to the second point, um, what now to do would deal with the concept, um, how useful it proves this concept to be the settlements. I would say for the respective parties, it's, um, and I have these discussions already at the Asian Foundation, good this week, there might be kind of limited usefulness in current ongoing negotiations because the actors in there, they very much know the situation on the ground. Even I would say that the Philippine government is very much the way they know very, very well what is going on in the various parts of the canal and then a lot of course. So this might not be the very important point for them bringing in another to move to understand better what they already understand in those cases. There's more the problem of tactical considerations in there, strategic imperatives which are in place. This is not really um, helpful then for another tour. But, but having said that, there is already a certain usefulness in some concrete interventions in the aftermath or even the preparation of negotiations. You have always the question of DDR, which is learned that it's not very popular here in, for MILF, since it's in the Philippines often um, very much uh, understood as a country insurgency concept. This DDR is the mobilization to, uh, to summon an integration component, but it's basically part of all these processes around the world since you have to deal somehow with the arms that are around, you have to deal with the military structures in place, you have to give a perspective for uh, combatants to get into something and beat the military and be used for sort of transforming the life into a regular somehow regular life. So you have to deal with that issues and there it might be very useful to have also for the international actors coming in that to this quite often. Um, to, have, to have an analytical tool which helps to understand where to integrate to, what problems might be, um, how to, to judge or how to, to um, well, judge the, the potential impact your um, interventions might have made on the world. And, and I hope I could demonstrate this somehow. We think that the tool has proved quite highly useful in terms of analysis especially if you do some kind of comparative research, which then comes up with, with certain points which then again are relevant perhaps for current ongoing or future negotiation processes. We found it quite quite interesting to work with that and we hope that uh, well the, the empirical findings we came up with have some way. Well with that uh, I thank you very much. Also thanks to the to the audience in, in Japan listening to that. Um, I hope it was of some interest to hear. Um, and of course, I'm looking forward to all the questions you want to have. It's very important for me also because we are going to be there, of course, to bring this also to the big forum. So, so it's, 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 it's,